All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, indeed, I'm going to actually brought, I brought in the title of my talk a little bit, uh, just to kind of focus on some of the things that we've been learning about the aging galaxy connection from candles. Uh, and is this too loud? It's okay there. Um, so yes, uh, I'm at Colby College. Uh, Liz McGrath and I are here with uh, a couple of undergrads from Colby. And uh, the work that I'll be presenting uh, today is actually largely done in collaboration with uh, Paul Nandra and Murray Brightman at MPE. I guess Murray Brightman actually just recently uh, transferred over to IPAC to work on New Star. Uh, Phil Hopkins down at Caltech, uh, Guillermo Barro here at UC Santa Cruz, and a large cast of characters from the Candles collaboration, uh, many of whom are, are here at Santa Cruz, including Joel and Sandy and David, of course. So we've been trying to address uh, two primary questions uh, regarding AGN at Register 2 with the candles uh, data. The first one is trying to understand what triggers black hole growth at a redshift of 2. So this is the epoch where uh, black hole growth is at its peak, and so we want to understand what are the physical mechanisms that are actually uh, uh, fueling this growth. Uh, the, we've been doing this primarily using morphologies, galaxy morphologies, so using the rest frame optical imaging from uh, what, from the Whitefield Camera 3 to look for telltale signatures of, of interactions and, and mergers that might be uh, fueling this growth that's, that's been predicted. And the second question is, what role, if any, do AGN play in quenching the first generation of passive galaxies? So this is, uh, the, the red, at redshift 2 to 3 is the epoch where massive red sequence galaxies first start to appear in large numbers, and so we want to understand uh, if uh, AGN feedback is playing in any role in uh, quenching the star formation activity of massive blue galaxies and driving them onto the red sequence. So I think we've made some great progress in answering the first question. And uh, so I'll, I'll spend the first half of the talk uh, discussing that, some results that we've co uh, come out regarding the triggering mechanisms in AGN. And then at the very end of the talk, I'll highlight some tantalizing results uh, tying perhaps a high AGN fraction to galaxies that are on, the, on their way to quenching and moving on to the red sequence. So let me start with uh, the triggering mechanisms of fueling modes. So before candles, the primary expectation was that by the time we got out to Rechester 2, the, uh, the main thing that is going to be triggering agent activity, even moderate luminosity agent activity at Rechester 2, would be uh, major mergers. So this is, uh, and this is from predictions such as uh, this luminosity, predicted luminosity function from Hopkins and Herquist, 2006, where they show, they predict uh, luminosity functions for AGN fueled by different processes, fueled by mergers and fueled by secular processes. And these two curves, these two luminosity functions are quite similar at redshift point one, but by the time you get out to redshift of uh, two, you find that the number density of AGN triggered by mergers is substantially greater than that triggered by uh, secular processes. So basically AGN fueled by stochastic means. And so this, so our expectation was that if you go out and sample the AGN population around the knee of the luminosity function, so about 10 to the 44 ergs per second, you should find that the hosts are predominantly ongoing mergers or merger remnants, essentially, if there's a time lag between when the merger happens and when the AGN kicks on. Uh, of course, this is actually what we don't find with candles. Uh, when we go in and we take a look at the uh, morphologies of the AGN hosts uh, at the knee of the luminosity function at redshift of two, we find that uh, we don't actually see an excess of, of merger activity relative to a control sample of galaxies. So here's just a montage of what some of these AGN hosts look like uh, in the F160 imaging on the top here and then the I-band imaging. So you, some of these guys completely drop out despite being quite massive. Um, the, the main thing that we find about these galaxies, about the AGN hosts, so here the AGN hosts are in red and the control galaxies, mass match control galaxies are in blue. The main thing we find about these guys is that they are actually uh, undisturbed. Only about, almost about 60% of the AGN hosts are undisturbed to the depth of the WSD3 imaging, and about half of them are located in undisturbed disks. So if you think that a disk is going to be destroyed in a major merger event, this fraction, this 50% fraction, uh, constrains right away that about half of the AGN hosts have not experienced a major merger in the recent past. And so this is uh, in great agreement with previous results that previous studies have looked at the morphologies of AGN hosts and, and have not found a significant difference between uh, the galaxies with growing black holes and, and normal galaxies. But it does, uh, it is in significant disagreement with those AGN fueling models, the Hopkins and Herquist 2006 fueling models. Uh, and we think we understand why this is now. And it has uh, largely to do with the gas fraction of the galaxies at these redshifts. So in a paper that, uh, that uh, Phil, Kevin Bundy, and I put out uh, last, last spring, 
we actually went back and revisited those Hopkins and Herquist fueling models, the 2006 fueling models, and the primary thing that was changed in those models was actually uh, a, a more steeply evolving gas fraction in those galaxies. So essentially we put in uh, gas fractions as high as 50% at redshifts of two, and, and then re, uh, recalculated those simulated luminosity functions in our three redshift bins, so going up from zero, Z of zero to zero two. And now we find, again, so here the, the red curve is the luminosity function for agent triggered by mergers, and the luminosity function triggered by secular process, uh, agent triggered by secular processes. And now what we find is that these two luminosity functions agree uh, uh, much better at redshift of two. So essentially, you get an equal number density of agent triggered by uh, uh, secular processes as you do by major mergers. So this tells us that the number density of agent hosted by disks should be quite, quite comparable to what we find in uh, merger or post-merger systems. So you can, you can integrate these luminosity functions and compare them to the disk fraction that we get as a function of agent luminosity. So this is now disk dominated hosts as a function of luminosity. Here we assume anything that's disk dominated is being fed by secular processes, so that blue curve. If you integrate these two luminosity functions, you could get fractions as a function of aging luminosity. And the curves here are, per, are predictions from the models, and the red points are what we observe with candles and at, uh, in slow and at low redshifts. And we find a, a, a crude agreement. This is a really quick and dirty uh, comparison to what we're finding, but the models seem to predict the, the fraction, the high fraction of disks that we're finding quite well. So this, by adding in these high gas fractions, we're essentially finding that you can reproduce fairly luminous AGN at redshift so two uh, without the need to merge. So essentially you just have this, uh, these stochastic processes going on. So, um, sorry, getting ahead of myself here. The, if you're still a fan of the major merger model, though, you, as Phil likes to point out, this red curve still shows the luminosity function for, the, or sorry, the number density for agent triggered by mergers should still exceed uh, that triggered by secular processes. So uh, you should still get about 50 or 60 percent of, uh, of the black hole growth, uh, the mass accretion, driven by mergers. And this is something we don't see in candles. We don't see a large population of of AGM being triggered by merger. At least half the population isn't uh, found in merger remnants where, we're, where we, uh, you know, we think we're seeing what's causing this, this predicted luminosity function. And so one of the questions uh, we have is where are these, uh, these systems that are, are undergoing major mergers that we're not seeing in candles? And one of the uh, possibilities is that they're heavily obscured. Uh, that the same gas is fueling these systems are actually uh, blocking our view of the central engine and that we're essentially not picking them up in our x-ray service. So to test this, uh, Paul uh, uh, Nandra and Murray Brightman and I went back and started looking at the morphologies of Compton thick sources out at Retchus of one. The idea here is that uh, even the most obscured agent can be detected using uh, uh, x-rays as long as the geometry of the torus is, is just right. So in this case, what we've done is we've uh, gone into our, to the deep uh, Chandra data and the good uh, fields. and done spectral modeling to identify, try to identify these Compton thick, uh, uh, thick sources based on their X-ray spectra. The idea here is that if you have, even if your line of sight is blocked by a, a, a torus, you can actually have X-ray photons scattering off the backside of the torus, and they scatter to low energies and into your line of sight, and this changes the, the X-ray spectrum of the source. So this is a, a Compton thick AGN at low redshift. Uh, the red line here is the intrinsic uh, power loss spectrum from the AGN, and the black line here is the observed spectrum. Uh, and this excess of soft energies is, in fact, this reflected component. That's, you're basically taking photons at high energies, reflected them down, and you have this soft excess. So this is, uh, produces this reflection-dominated spectrum that, uh, if you have deep Chandra observations, you can go in and actually uh, model your, uh, the spectrum of your AGN and try to look for this soft access. This is exactly what we've done. So uh, Murray just put out a paper uh, where uh, he did the spectral modeling in the, good, in the Good South, EGS, and the Cosmos field. So here's uh, three examples of uh, these Compton thick sources at Z of 1 that we've identified. The red here is, again, the intrinsic torus emission. The black uh, dashed line is the, the scattered emission. And then the black solid line is the best fit to the, to the, uh, to the points there. So uh, using the, the deep Chandra observations, we've actually gone in and identified a, a sample of about 100 of these sources out at redshift of one. So this is, uh, is uh, X-ray luminosity versus redshift. 
Uh, the color coding here for these guys is the uh, line of sight column density. So the, uh, the obscuring column density, anything that has a red color here is Compton thick. So essentially has a column density of NH of greater than 10 to the 24 uh, per centimeter squared. And so you can basically see that, uh, so th sorry, this is absorption corrected luminosity. So we've essentially uh, corrected for the obscuring gas. And what happens is, as you can see, most of the Compton thick sources that we're finding are, are exceptionally luminous. So essentially we're only picking up the most luminous guys since we can only detect the the small fraction of their emission that's being scattered back into our line of sight. So we've identified 121 heavily obscured sources. So uh, we've made a cut at NH greater than 10 to the 23.5. And we've done a very simple test. We actually went out and took a look at their morphologies and compared them to less obscured agent with similar uh, absorption corrected luminosities. So uh, in this case, we've, we have a control sample of uh, about 300 moderately obscured AGN and about 300 uh, unobscured AGN based on our spectral modeling, based on the, our best fit NH that come from uh, the spectral modeling. And again, all these guys are matched in X-ray luminosity to the luminosity of our heavily obscured Compton thick sources. And when we take a look at their morphologies, uh, we find something quite striking. The guys that are heavily obscured are substantially more disturbed than uh, their unobscured counterparts. So there are Compton thick sources are, are on the top here. They're uh, more often in disks. They have a more clumpy structure. They're more asymmetric, or they just have something strange going on. The unobscured sources are relatively smooth. Uh, you can occasionally see uh, the point source uh, coming through. Uh, but essentially, if you uh, apply the same visual classification scheme that we did, that we applied with candles for the ZFT sources on these guys, what we find is that the fraction of uh, AGN hosts with uh, disturbed morphologies as a function of their obscuring column density uh, basically increases as you get to more heavily obscured sources. So we find a statistically significant excess of disturbed morphologies in our, in our Compton thick sources relative to our unobscured sources. Uh, Uh, yeah, sorry, this is, so these guys are at redshift one because we don't have enough WIFC3 coverage for, yeah, for, for the Compton Thick study. Um, but uh, I just want to emphasize that this is a fixed luminosity, so this is not a luminosity effect. It's not that the Compton Thick sources are, are, more, are, uh, are more heavily creating relative to uh, their unobscured counterparts. This is basically just uh, uh, an obscuration effect. So uh, we haven't matched in mass, but we have matched in obscuration corrected luminosity. Um, so this is just a, a summary of uh, the host morphologies versus obscuration. So this is uh, basically the, the blue points here are unobscured sources. The green points are, are uh, moderately obscured, and our red points are our Compton thick sources. So we see an increase in the disk fraction as a function of uh, obscuration, a decrease in the spheroid fraction, uh, a, a significantly <laughs> higher fraction of point sources, uh, as to be expected for the unobscured sources. Um, our, the disturbed fraction is, increases, and even if we're more conservative about what we call an uh, interaction or merger, so we throw out things that just have asymmetric morphologies, we find a, uh, still find a statistically significant, about 2.7 sigma excess of, of interactions and mergers in the Compton thick sources relative to our unobscured sources. So what this is telling us is that our observations are very consistent with an evolutionary scenario. This is, uh, you can't explain the difference in the morphologies in the disk fraction, for example, simply based on orientation, so a, a standard unification model. Uh, it looks like as we're probing more heavily obscured systems, we're actually probing further down an evolutionary sequence where our typical X-ray selected AGN are in these, uh, are unobscured sources in these disks. So you get some fraction of unobscured and obscured sources based on orientation. As you start probing more heavily obscured sources, you're finding systems closer to this interaction uh, stage. And then at some point, the obscuration probably gets so great that we're just missing these systems that are heavily obscured. These are likely the infrared selected sources that are being detected by Jen Donnelly, uh, where she's finding that the morphology of the guys, even in the candles data at ZF2, are heavily disturbed. So it looks like our heavily obscured AGN, we're, we're kind of proposing that our heavily obscured AGN fit in this evolutionary sequence before the train wreck merger phase, but after the interaction has actually begun. This is why they predominantly look like disks and they predominantly have uh, disturbed morphologies. Our unobscured sources. Uh, have, uh, have look essentially like spheroids, so we're, you know, we're looking at them after they've uh, come through this sequence. And uh, there's evidence that you know, these, these dust reddened quasars might be this intermediate stage after the merger when the quasar is still going and the dust has been blown out. 
Right? We think the, the, our, our heavily obscured uh, Compton thick sources detected in the X-rays are actually being found before this uh, merger stage. So this is all done at redshifts of one, uh, simply because we don't have enough WIFC3 coverage at a redshift of two to, to test whether this extends out or whether this actually gets amplified at redshift of two. Uh, we expect it actually would be amplified at redshift of two based on uh, Phil's simulated uh, luminosity functions. And so uh, fortunately, uh, we just got a cycle 22 program approved to image 33 uh, Compton thick sources of Z of two to follow up on this. So these guys, we have 25 orbits uh, to spend in Good South, EGS, and, and Cosmos. Uh, all of the pointings are, uh, have, are gonna be, fall on the existing ACS imaging. So it essentially means that we're gonna be expanding uh, uh, slightly the candle's footprint. So this is uh, a few of the pointings. So essentially each of these tiles has a compton thick source at, at the center. And uh, I don't show Cosmos here because they're scattered all over the, all over the field. But uh, for EGS and, and Goods, we'll be adding a few tiles to the, I just, uh, 25 orbits is, is quite nice because uh, you know, it, it's almost the equivalent of an additional candles wide field that we'll be adding, just that it's dispersed all over, the, all the, over these three fields. All right, so going back to the original question, what triggers AGN activity at ZU2? I think what we found out is that it's, uh, it's more complicated than we originally thought. Uh, the high gas fractions in uh, ZU2 disks means that secular processes are much more important than we previously thought. And so essentially, you can end up producing high luminosity AGN in a relatively high, I should say moderate luminosity, um, 10 to the 44 ergs per second AGN uh, in a regular disk galaxy simply because of these high gas fractions. And once we incorporate this, the, the high gas fractions into uh, Phil's fueling models, we actually find that the disk fraction is consistent with, uh, with, these, uh, with these updated fueling models. Um, couple that with the fact that it appears that these heavily obscured agents are more disturbed than their unobscured counterparts, and we're only picking up the tip of the iceberg because we're only picking up the most luminous sources that are scattering their, their uh, uh, X-ray photons back into our line of sight. You combine these two, and it looks like the fact that you have you know, many luminous AGN and disks plus this incompleteness at high obscuration uh, may explain why we don't actually see this convincing AGN merger connection that, that models are still predicting, like Phil's models are still predicting, even at retches of two. Um, so I think it's probably just a combination of, of two of these things. As we start getting more, as we start looking at the morphologies of more of these heavily obscure sources, I think we can start to constrain what fraction of, uh, how much of a problem we have, what fraction of these uh, merger triggered AGN are still missing. Okay, so with that, let me switch to the second half of uh, the talk. And yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a really good question. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Whether there's enough IR detected AGN to explain it. Yeah, just IR galaxies. I, yeah, I was going to say. Right. And if you, yeah, and then, yeah, what fraction of that, of those star forming guys are going to be AGN? Yeah, you could probably play with it, the duty cycle, however you want to get something out. Okay, great. Um, it's, I, it definitely warrants looking into. Yeah, exactly. Do we have any, actually, that's, that, that might be even better constraint. Do we have enough mergers in the IR luminous population to explain what's left over? That's right. Um, all right, so let me, let me just touch on quenching a little bit here. Uh, so if we want to understand the second question, quenching, the, what, if we want to understand what role AGN are playing in uh, shutting off star formation, in uh, these systems at high redshift. One of the things we need to do is first identify the quenching pathways that galaxies are following, for moving from the blue cloud on the red sequence. Uh, and one of the, a, a key hint here is actually encoded into the structure of the galaxies themselves. We know that the, uh, the effective radius or the size of the galaxies as a function of, uh, or of passive galaxies decreases uh, uh, significantly with redshift. So at redshift of two, uh, these uh, massive, uh, you know, quenched galaxies are substantially smaller than their blue counterparts, which basically means that you simply, you can't simply uh, turn off the star formation activity of a blue cloud galaxy and have it uh, move on to the red sequence. You actually need to change its structure before that happens. Or that galaxy had to have started out very small before it actually quenched. 
Uh, luckily, with candles, we think we've actually identified the, the, uh, one of these quenching pathways by identifying the, the, um, the star forming, the compact star forming progenitors of these red nugget galaxies. So this is uh, work from Guillermo Barro. This is, uh, I'm sure Guillermo is going to talk about this in, in much more length tomorrow. But essentially, Guillermo's found these, these compact star forming galaxies that we think are the direct progenitors, structurally look identical to uh, the compact red nuggets, and it looks like they're the direct progenitors of these guys. All we need to do is quench their star formation activity. You can see these guys a little bit better in this plot. This is uh, U minus V, uh, color versus uh, mass. The color coding here is based on the candle's visual morphology. So the red here are uh, the disc galaxies, or sorry, the red are the spheroids, uh, the blue are the discs. And this is in good, just in Good South. You can correct this plot for uh, dust. So now we've got a nice blue cloud and red sequence. You can maybe convince yourself that there's a morphology trend there in the colors. Um, and like I said, you can't simply take one of these blue cloud galaxies and, and quench its star formation activity, have it move on to the red sequence. You need to actually change its structure. So we can fold in a, a, the size of the galaxy into here by dividing by the, the radius of the, uh, the effective radius to the one fifth power. So this is the uh, Guillermo's sigma value. And now we've got, I've, cut, I've changed the um, scaling here. The, the symbol size is now reflects the, si the physical size of the galaxy in kiloparsecs. And so everything to uh, the right of this line will be considered compact. Everything above that line will be considered quenched. So these guys are your, uh, the so-called red nuggets, and these are Guillermo's compact star forming progenitors. And structurally, these compact star forming genders are identical to their uh, red nugget counterparts. They have the same mass, they have the same, uh, 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 roughly the same velocity dispersions. So it looks like all we need to do is turn off their star formation activity and they'll quench and become red nuggets. So Gamma proposed two uh, quenching pathways in this plot. So this fast track quenching where galaxies uh, become small, they quench and become red and a slow track quenching where uh, these more extended guys, these may be halos, they may be, uh, their structure's not changing, they're simply turning off the star formation and, and becoming red as extended systems. Um, Joel has, uh, and we see this in our simulations, this is a, uh, thanks. Uh, this is a great um, gift from uh, Joel and Lauren Porter's work showing these systems, systems that are compact at redshifts of uh, 2.5 and following their evolution. You can see them getting smaller, they quench, and they move up, and so you can see them following through this, this pathway. Now the reason why I'm, mentioned, I'm walking you through all this is because this is where uh, the X-ray AGN, uh, the X-ray luminous AGN live at a redshift of two in this phase space. So essentially we're finding a high AGN fraction right where we need that quenching uh, to actually happen, right where we see this knee in uh, the, this quenching pathway. So the AGN fraction here is about 48%. That's about uh, five times greater than the duty cycle at any other place in this diagram. So uh, the AGN fraction in the red sequence in the blue cloud barely breaks about 10% uh, at this redshift, but we're finding this extremely high duty cycle. So essentially, even if you don't believe that the AGN are actually doing anything to, to cause the quenching of these systems and move them up to the red sequence, it's telling us that black hole growth is actually uh, uh, quite ubiquitous in these systems right before they quench. Whether you believe these guys puff up later to become present-day ellipticals or whether they form this few, the bulges of present-day bulge-dominated disks, um, either way, it looks like there was a lot of black hole growth going on right before uh, that system actually quenched. Um, and I like to you know, hint at the possible role of aging and quenching in this, in this phase. I should point out that in Joel's, in the simulations, this quenching is going on without aging and feedback. So this is just star formation shutting itself off. So it could be that the picture is more complex than a simple qu quasar blowout. Uh, mode that, in fact, it could be that the AGN here are simply preventing that gas, any further gas from coalescing out of these systems and keeping that, keeping those systems cool. So, um, yeah, I'm sure we'll hear more about that from Amishai's group. Okay, so let me, um, let me just, in the last minute I have here, let me just highlight one bit of future work, and that is the, uh, the UDS Chandra XVP survey so that uh, many of you guys are involved in. So, one of the, uh, we just got approved a Cycle 16 Chandra uh, XVP project, so uh, Gunther Hasegur and I are, uh, are leading it. It's 25 ACES eye pointings covering 22 by 22 uh, arc minutes in the SEDS area, so uh, essentially this is the candles area here, the WIFC3 tiles, the, uh, this is the SEDS deep IRAC imaging, and our 25 pointings are shown in magenta here, and that's the uh, overall exposure map. 
We have about a 1.25 megaseconds in total to cover the field, and we're going to get about 700 kiloseconds of, uh, of depth in the WIFC-3 uh, region. And we're, we have a couple of science goals, uh, most related to what I've been talking about here, is that we're actually going to use the deep observations to identify more of these Compton thick agents selected by their X-ray spectra. So basically, we need photons to do this X-ray spectral modeling. And once we do that, we can basically start using the WIFC-3 imaging to take a look at uh, their morphology of these, these systems at, at high redshifts. And uh, the other science goal is uh, uh, a little bit out there. We're looking for nature of the nature of black hole seeds at reaches 6 to 10. So this is by cross-correlating the, the unresolved X-ray background with the unresolved uh, infrared background. And uh, this is a, a result from EGS. So essentially, this is uh, the X-ray background coming, or the correlation function coming from star-forming galaxies out to redshift of 6. And this is uh, some unknown population, uh, thought to be perhaps many quasars between a redshift of 6 to 10. And uh, this result is detected at, at about 3.2 sigma. In EGS, we expect it to go about to eight sigma if the results hold in, in the UDS. So the observations for the, for the XVP start in the fall, so we actually just submitted the phase two last night for the project. So if you're uh, interested in, in getting involved, let me know. All the data is going to be public, and we're going to be sharing it with everybody in Candles. OK, let me put up my summary slide and stop there. Sure, go for it, Joe. Uh, well, thanks for showing that uh, nice thing yeah. of uh, the evolving. So those are the objects that go through the uh, right-hand bottom, in other words, the compact star forming. Uh, now, uh, in that earlier work by Lauren Porter, the first two papers are now uh, on the archive and accepted for publication. Uh, the this would be the third paper, and Rachel Somerville has taken over. Uh, I've heard, yeah, that's right. Lauren has left the field. Uh, and one of the things that we wanted to do, because the model predicts it, is to say uh, exactly when the AGNs turn on and how bright they are. And what we're finding is that if we put in a delay of one or two hundred million years, uh, then it beautifully. Yeah, that'd the be data. great. Uh, and this is relevant also to the first part of your talk, because. Uh, in that paper you wrote uh, with Phil Hopkins and Kevin Bundy, you just had quote unquote stochastic right. Uh, right. Uh, triggering of AGN, whereas we have a very specific model, namely disk instability, or right. what Abishai likes to call violent disk instability. Right. Uh, something like 60% of that motion from the diffuse to compact is triggered by that instability. And that builds bulges that look like classical bulges, as far as we can tell. In fact, uh, unless you look very carefully, it's going to look like a merger, though you won't see the tidal tails, so right, right. symmetries and all those things. Uh, it's going to be a challenge, actually, observationally, to figure out which is which. We're, we're right. working on that. Uh, Greg Snyder, in particular, has been uh, putting a lot of effort into that. Right, right, right. But uh, mainly, I wanted to say that what we're doing here is trying to model what you're calling stochastic or right. uh, secular processes. Right. And uh, it's, it's this disability right. phenomenon that's also associated with the very clumpy galaxies, as far as we right. can tell. And I'm sure Abishai and I so we, we leave the details to you. That. We leave the details to you, Joe. Let's can we get Jennifer? Sure. Um, so I was having a little trouble reconciling your results with the Hubble Space Telescope and the Hubble Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, the the one the, it, you have to be careful with it a little bit in that the if you actually calculate the hardness ratios for those Compton thick sources, they're extremely soft because they have a soft excess. There, you, you've got this. So if you don't actually model the spectrum right, the hardness ratio will will mess you up there. So in in those in Cyprian's work. Uh, basically, the, they didn't do any spectral modeling, so they just looked at the hardness ratios. And you you assume or you hope that basically you know you're you you do not have a large compact thick fraction that's contaminating your soft sources falling in there. Um, most of the soft sources, the hardness ratios are going to be unobscured. But um, yeah, so I think it'll be interesting when we extend this to Zia two to see what the morphologies are of the compact thick sources. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So it could be that when we do this at Z of 2, we find out that all these guys in this compact region are the compact thick sources. Yeah. So let me ask Tiago to come up again. Um, and quickly we'll go Abishai and then Abishai. I think that uh, at Redshift 6, the 
stretches to the distinction between mergers and secular processes right. is not a very good idea. Right. There are no secular processes to achieve to, okay? In the sense there are no slow, nice processes. It's all violent processes. Stuff comes in very intensely along those streams <coughs> and includes major mergers, many more minor mergers, <coughs> and very intense <coughs> grumpy streams. So there's this whole spectrum of stuff coming in very violently, and that's why I think it's much more healthy to think about it as, as a very intense process with a spectrum of, of objects coming in. And the major measures are just, you know, the tail, the tail of this distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, so then you may find a more better agreement with what's really happening here. Right, right. I mean, I should point out that in, in Phil's paper, yeah, we, we gloss over the secular processes. I, somebody asked me just recently at the Durham meeting, do we actually see the secular processes doing that feeding? Do we see bars? Do we see? I, the answer is no, we don't actually see. So we assume there's some secular process going on, but. Yeah. Which John referred to, but it's not secular. It's also very valid. Right. Okay, very quickly, quick question, Peter. Yeah, so I just wondering in the lower right hand budget, which is now gone, but. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we, we actually do fit that in our X-ray uh, modeling. Um, we don't have good modeling for those sources at, at ZF2, but we... Um, but if, if yeah. The must be, yeah, or the duty cycle is just insane, so you're seeing them. But um, yeah, so essentially that's one of the things we're going to do when we actually get this deep data and start getting... Because essentially right now we don't have enough of those sources, so that's one of the things we're going to hopefully do with the UDS uh, data is to look into this. Yeah. Thanks very much.